Good morning, everyone. Today is the first day of the Ace Hope meeting. First, we have Professor Lin's lecture. Let me introduce the moderator for this session, Dr. Masato Ikeda from Gifu University. Dr. Ikeda, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Masato Ikeda uh, from Gifu University, the center of Japan, geometrically. And I will be the moderator of this session. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the lecture of this session, uh, Professor Jean-Marie Len from France. Uh, in 1939, he was born in France. And in 1960, he graduated from the University of Strasbourg and received PhD from the same university in 1963 at the age of four, uh, 24. Yeah. Then he became postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Professor Robert Van Utward in Harvard University, uh, who was uh, no awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1965, where uh, he participated in the total synthesis of vitamin B12. And in 1970, at the age of 31, he became full professor of chemistry at Université de Passer in Strasbourg, that is the uh, University of Strasbourg. And also in 1979, he uh, became the chair of chemistry at the Collège de France in Paris. So on his return to Strasbourg, uh, he has focused on chemical basis of molecular recognition, which plays an important role in many biological processes. And the field was later called supramolecular chemistry. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in uh, 1987 at the age of 48 for the development and the use of molecules with structure-specific interactions of high selectivity shared with Professor Kram and Dr. Pedersen. He is the actual father of supramolecular chemistry, which he named the field. And until now, he published more than 950 scientific papers. And he has been actively inspiring the scientists in many fields. So OK, uh, today, uh, Professor Jamali Nen will speak on the subject toward complex matter chemistry. Uh, chemistry. Professor Jamari Den, please. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to tell you about chemistry. Sometimes it doesn't go down so well, but we'll see. But before starting, I would like to thank the JSPS for the invitation to come here. It is a very interesting meeting. I've been very often in Lindau, which is the sort of the parallel meeting in uh, Europe. But here, there's a very different kind of crowd around from another regions of the world. And that's most enjoyable to see a large number of uh, young scientists from this region of the world. I also would like to thank uh, JSPS for having established their French office in Strasbourg. So I'm very close to them in many instances. And uh, we are very happy to have them in Strasbourg because the JSPS is such a well-known organization that having them in the town is very important for us and for the university. So what am I going to tell you? Some perspectives in chemistry, not all of them. Chemistry is a wide field, so just some. And how we can achieve through chemistry and understanding of complex matter. In order to do that, we have to start very early on. We have to start really at the beginning, here. After the Big Bang, there was no chemistry. It was much too hot for that. There was, at that time, physics. It's the age of physics. As the universe very quickly cooled down, particles formed aggregates between one another to generate atoms. 
when atoms were generated, then it began the time where these atoms could get together and make more complex entities, and chemistry started around this time here, 300,000 years or something like that. So the age of chemistry started, but it didn't stop there, of course, as we know. So these chemical compounds, they aggregated in a more or less random way, generated different types of structures. Eventually, these structures might define compartments, and these compartments then give rise to what we may call primitive cells. And at some stage, a new property appeared in matter, which is called life, which you don't understand for the moment, which only understand in molecular terms. And that's the age of biology. Life on our planet Earth started more or less there, the age of biology on our planet. Because there are many other planets where there is life, very probably. But it didn't stop there. And interestingly enough, of course, that's why we are here, something else appeared, which is thinking, thought. I represent that by this very famous statue, statue by the French sculptor Auguste Rodin, the thinker. And this certainly characterizes mankind. But let me first, before I continue, point out one very important thing. This picture is not finished at this point. It's the end of the screen, but it's not the end of evolution of the universe. Things will change. We will change in 10,000 years. I don't know how we will look, but we will change. And I think nowadays there are so many people telling us, let's stop it, that's the way we are. No, we are not the end of evolution. The universe doesn't bother about us. It just will continue. So now, having looked at that, we can try to characterize this way towards complex matter by parameters. Let's say that these systems, as I have shown, they become more and more complicated, complex. So we can consider that complexity information in matter is a parameter of interest. And the function of time, matter was first divided, particles. Then it became condensed. They came together, making molecules. Then from that, these things became organized. Then after being organized, at some stage, living, then thinking, and maybe something else. We don't know what, but maybe something else. We don't know. Very difficult to think about your own thinking. And this is the way towards complex matter. And it looks like there is some sort of a pressure of getting some regions in the universe more organized, more full of information. Others not, but some regions. Now, then is a very basic question we have to ask. The big question, as I call it. This is, how does matter become complex? What are the ways by which matter can become complex? How can it go from an elementary particle to a thinking organism? And there are higher forms of complex matter, maybe even. So for that, mankind has cre created science. That's why you are here also, science. Now, let's just consider three fields in science. Science has many areas, but let's consider three. On one hand, physics studies the laws of the universe the laws on which everything depends. Everything else depends on the laws, the general laws of the universe. These are laws. Biology tries to rules of life. They're not laws, they're rules which depend on the others. Now, what is chemistry doing? Chemistry is trying to build a bridge. Chemistry is trying to understand how general laws can result in an expression of a specific thing like a living organism on a planet called Earth and maybe others somewhere else. And this how to build that bridge is what chemistry can do. That's the role of chemistry. Try to understand how general laws can lead to specific things like us. Now, the answer to that question is self-organization. Now, this says everything and nothing. It means that our universe is built in such a way that it self-organizes. But how does it do that? You can claim that it is even more a cosmic imperative, that the laws of our universe are such that it will organize somewhere on its purpose by itself. But how? So chemists have been studying over the times what this matter is made of. And a very important step was accomplished by a very famous person, Dmitri Mendeleev, when he proposed that these pieces, the chemists around along the years until the middle of the 19th century had found and called elements, could be organized in a table. He showed that this thing is not just chaotic, not just a zoo of things. It is organized. And this resulted in a very important paper in 19, 1869. I consider this as one of the most important papers in science. 
because it showed that the bricks of matter can be organized in a rational fashion. And this is now called the periodic table of the elements, as all the chemists around, I guess, all the scientists should know. How does it look today? It looks like this. This is the periodic table of elements today. For the chemist, that is trivial. But let me insist on it, because it's not trivial at all. It is not trivial because this table, which is the present table, shows you the bricks of matter, of visible matter. I forget about dark matter and dark energy. The bricks of visible matter everywhere in the universe. There are no other bricks. This is very important. You are sitting in this room, and you know what any living entity somewhere else, billions of light years away, is made of. OK? Realize that mankind has been able to define the bricks which make visible matter everywhere. It's quite fantastic. So that's the playground of chemistry. That's where we play. Chemists play with that. They are like children, Lego. You know what Lego is, of course. Building things with Lego, putting things together, trying to see what can be combined and so on, and making an enormous variety of objects. Now, the atom is the start. From that, you build molecules, houses, from bricks. And this is the start of molecular chemistry over the years. Molecular chemistry is, this is mainly for those who are not really chemists, but I guess it's the basis. Molecular chemistry is to take elements and link them together in a strong fashion, covalent bonds. Now, this is the attempt to organize matter in a design fashion by using the bricks and building out of them complicated, more and more complicated houses, molecules. Two milestones I would like just to mention to sort of figure out how, where we stand. First of all, Friedrich Wöhler in Germany synthesized urea in 1828. He made urea, which is a compound contained in a living organism, from ammonium cyanate, which is a non-living object. I mean, it's not contained in living matter. So this was very important for two reasons. First of all, because he made something in the laboratory. He did what we call a synthesis. But also, very importantly, he made out of a ammonium cyanate, which is not present in living matter, urea, which is present in living matter. And at that time, of Wöhler, one was thinking that that needs a magic force, vital force, to make anything contained in an organism. Wöhler showed that that is wrong, that there is no such thing like a vital force, that molecules are molecules, and living or not living, it's all the same game. Now, this evolved, and 150 years later or so, was made in the laboratory this very complicated molecule, vitamin B12, as you can see, much more complicated in urea. This required the efforts of two groups, that of Robert Burns Woodward here, and Albert Eschenmoser, Woodward at Harvard, Eschenmoser at ETH in Zurich, helped by many, many people. I was one of them, and uh, 120 or so uh, co-workers in about 10 years succeeded in constructing this in the way chemists call total synthesis, taking the atoms, putting them in the right place, in the right position, stepwise. There were about 90 steps to go through. Now, my piece is this piece here, in the synthesis. I also like to show that, not because it's my piece, but to show that when you do science, you are part of an enormous project. You are uh, uh, bringing a stone, maybe a small, maybe a big stone, but it's your stone. You bring it in and you contribute to it. Now, of course, in the last years and in the 50 years which have evolved more or less since the synthesis, molecular chemistry has developed further, have become more and more complex, and no more complicated molecules have been made, new properties, new procedures, new reactions, new drugs, new materials, and so on. But then one can ask a question. Once molecular chemistry is well advanced, an adult science, a strong science, is there another aspect one should be looking for? And this I want to illustrate in that way. Now, this looks like biology. OK, it is. We call it biology. It's a cancer cell, two killer cells. The killer cells are running around in your organism as you're sitting here and trying to find out what is going wrong. And if they find the cell which has gone wrong, they have to destroy it. How do they know? How do the killer cells know that there's a cancer cell there, sitting there, and they have to destroy it? If they make a mistake, you have a big problem. Either you destroy a healthy cell, or you do not destroy a cancer cell. 
Another example, HIV virus. When it hits a white blood cell, it can infect. How does a virus know it has reached a target and can infect? So something must happen between these bodies, which in fact are just defined by molecules, we define their membrane, this touching tells them something. So there must, something must happen between them, between the molecules which define these bodies. And there may be, there must be some way of talking to each other, and this way of talking to each other we have called then a chemistry which lies beyond the molecule, which is supramolecular chemistry, that means the chemistry which happens between chemical objects, not inside. Inside is important because you need the molecules first, but then what happens when they get together, when they talk to each other, when they touch each other? And this then developed over the years, and here the bonding features which have now to be considered are what is called the non-covalent bonds. In other words, these weaker interactions which exist between molecules once the covalent bonds are saturated, are completely used up. And this is like, one could say, the, the covalent bonds are very strong nuts and bolts, whereas uh, the supermolecular chemistry is like gluing them together, sort of feeling, touching, and so on. And the three basic properties, if you studied over the years, is how do molecules recognize each other, recognition, how do they react with each other, how can they carry each other through a barrier, like a cell membrane. So molecular recognition is the basic features of in, feature of interest, and this then led to this development of a field where these features were studied. So molecular chemistry, 1828, resulted in learning how to more and more be able to control how one can build up complex molecules. Some of them, one may call them receptors, are those which can catch others, receive them, catch them. And then in 17, 1978, we defined supramolecular chemistry as the area where this receptor now can bind the substrate and lead to, through non-covalent interactions, to these aggregates, this way in which they can get together to generate recognition features, transformation features, and translocation or transport, giving, therefore, functional supramolecular systems. Now, <clears throat> many laboratories have studied this. This is now 50 years old. In fact, we see, celebrated this year the 50 years of my group. And so many people around the world have been uh, working in it, and a lot of very, very exciting work has been going on. Japan has very much contributed to that. I have many friends here, and we have very, have very much contributed to it. Now let's have a look at this molecular recognition in a simple way. Of course, you can compute, but let's look at it more simply. Molecular recognition, first of all, needs interaction. You have to glue the things have to talk to each other. If there's no interaction, you ignore. So they have to bind in some way. But that's not enough. What is very important is molecular recognition supposes also information. In other words, a molecule cannot recognize another one without information present. So there must be some way of storing that information. And the double complementarity one may uh, consider is that there's a complementarity in shape, in geometry, and the complementarity interactions. Interactions meaning simply if you put it very simply, minus attracts plus, and plus repels plus. Okay, electrostatics and so on. But of course, one can now do it in a much more complicated way. But let's remain simple at this stage. Now, this idea of molecular recognition, in fact, was already present, not with the same words, not with the same concepts behind, but with the right idea. Who? Emil Fischer. Emil Fischer, in 1894, one of these other very important papers, published a paper in 1894 when he studied the interaction of an enzyme with a substrate, saying that in order to act on each substrate, enzymes and substrates have to fit together like Schloss und Schlüssel, like a lock and a key. Very simple. Of course, we now know that these things are somewhat flexible, they can adjust, but nevertheless, that was very important. They have to fit together like a lock and a key. Very basic, simple image, but very strong one. So. The molecular storage of information is something important. And if we want to look at one information system which is very important, you certainly admit that this is a very important one for us. What makes a, a difference between a tomato and an elephant is that. This is the information stored in the genome of living, pardon, in the genome of living organisms, 
This is written with chemistry. There's a long chain, which is such a way to put things on. On this chain are fixed letters, which are chemical groups, very simple, trivial chemical groups, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, HETC. And these four letters are enough to write all the genomes of the living organisms. And the reading done is supramolecular. They touch each other. They touch by two points of interactions or three points of interaction. And this is a binary system to read it. So four is enough to store. Two combinations is enough to read. Of course, nature didn't evolve further because it's enough. And often nature stops when it's enough. But why try more? And now chemists are trying to make long, to make, put more letters in the genome, to have more eating patterns. So that's very exciting, of course. But the evolution I didn't stop, I could say. But when it was, so to say, happy, when it had enough to do the, to do the job. Now, one may also then say that chemistry is not only what it is always considered, and which it is, the science of the transformation, the structure, how it is made, and the transformation of matter. But it is very importantly also an information science. Chemistry like biology, of course, which is the complicate, the most complex chemistry we know of, this is an information science. Molecules carry information. The way they get together is the reading, the the, the way you can feel, you read this information, you can process it. So the storage is at the molecular level, and the processing is at the, in, at the supramolecular level. This can lead then to the idea that chemists can program the chemical systems they want to make. And let me just show you our initial motivations. I think for you, many of you, uh, most of you are at the beginning of a career, how you don't know where you will end up. You start somewhere, you don't know where you end up. Our initial motivations were that I was interested in neurochemistry, chemistry of the neural system, as in the 1960s. As a poor chemist, I said, look, how can we handle something like that? I, cannot, I don't understand anything about the neural system. So I said, what is the process which is simple to understand and nevertheless very important? So what is it? The propagation of the nerve influx. Why? Because when the nerve influx, the action potential along a nerve, depends on sodium and potassium ions going through membranes. Sodium potassium, that's what the chemist knows well. So that's a simple thing. So why not try to figure that out? So this is what happens in the action potential. Potassium, sodium ions are selectively exchanged through membranes, and that generates this information which makes me move my arm because it runs the signals right down the nerves. So question then, how can you design entities which selectively recognize sodium or potassium ions and which can carry them through membranes. So let's be quick and short here. Since metal, these sodium potassium ions are the simplest objects in chemistry in three-dimensional space, that means a sphere, which have as one positive charge, we have in addition a very nice collection of that in the periodic table of Mendeleev. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, spheres of increasing size bearing one positive charge. And in this, there are two, sodium and potassium, which are very important also biologically and chemically, but especially biologically. So the question is, how can we selectively bind and carry those things through membranes? And this would be then achieving sp uh, spherical molecular recognition. The answer is, if we go back to 1894 with Emil Fischer, if these are the keys, let's build the locks. Chemists can go to the lab, they design these things, and they make them. That's, very, uh, very, that's why I'm a chemist, in fact. This very powerful way of chemists say, I want to make this, and I make it, even if it had never existed before. So these are the objects we made. Now, uh, I hate to say 1967 and 68, sort of, sort of uh, not yesterday. Where these things, these are these molecules which look like crypts, we call them cryptans, have a hole in the middle, and the hole has more or less the shape, it has a spherical shape. The small hole, lithium, larger hole, sodium, larger hole, potassium. So just play accordion on your molecules, you arrange them in such a way. That is just to illustrate the beginnings, but of course, there were now many, many, many things have been done to make many more complicated molecules and to understand better and better or the basis of the log and key, but of course, with all the computerization, I cannot do all the computations, all the designs and all that. But here, just illustrated, that's the log, the three keys, the red key goes in, and this is sort of the principle of this 
study of molecular recognition, where many, many laboratories studied recognition processes, which is the basis. After that, come the rest, but that's the basis. And as you are sitting here, without molecular recognition, you don't exist, because the molecules would make plenty of mistakes. They shouldn't make mistakes, if not you are in trouble. So, some applications in life sciences of this field, which is, not, which is very, very well developed. First of all, it's quite obvious, drug discovery. Now, we didn't wait for the definition of supermolecular chemistry to make drugs, but understanding how a drug can interact with the target, this is very important for designing them. And indeed, a drug is a key for a molecular lock, a biological lock in an organism. And you want this key to be as specific as possible, to get in there and just to act only, if possible, on the real, con the correct lock. Then it happens, and just to illustrate a few things, that because we had made these cages, because one could, can modify them, one can introduce in the center of the cages other things, we made one which had a europium ion in the middle. Europium ions have the property of emitting red light under excitation, and so with this cage, a different one, one could then use it as a label for an immunodiagnostic methodology developed by Gérard Matisse at a small French company, and this is now used in many hospitals. Another area of interest was gene transfer. How did we come to that? Uh, we are not the only ones, of course, many people are interested in gene transfer, but making it, transferring a piece of DNA, a gene, with a chemical compound means that what you have to do is to sort of pick up the gene with molecules which sort of hide it so you can penetrate the cell membrane, go through the cell membrane, and so these synthetic vectors here, as I call them here, synthetic vectors were designed by us and also by many other laboratories, it's a very active field, to get the gene inside the cell, which is of interest for gene therapy and for biotechnology. Here again also I would like to say a word about biotechnology, gene therapy, and genetically modified organisms. I am very much in favor of genetically modified organisms, and I think I ran the resistance against that, which now comes up here and there, is wrong. We need them. We need them in the future. And if you see people in the street who are against it, try to convince them that it is wrong. And the life of many people depends on that, and also the health of others. So, what about, and biomaterials can also be supramolecular. I will give you later on an example of interest. Now, supramolecular chemistry has led to a better understanding of recognition, information, and beyond pre-organization, I call that, making locks for keys or keys for locks in the laboratory. Then you can try to use this knowledge for generating self-organization, making chemical systems which on the basis of how the bricks are constructed will automatically organize and generate a given entity structure. Now, I hear for those in the room who are more on the physical chemistry side, uh, I just would like to point out that, of course, it can be equilibrium self-organization or non-equilibrium. What I am going to tell you is only equilibrium. But, of course, the next step for sure is to also study in the laboratory out of equilibrium, non-equilibrium self-organization. Living systems are out of equilibrium. We know that we are out of equilibrium. Our equilibrium states State is water, CO2, ammonia, some calcium carbonate, and stuff like that. Huh? That is what we will become at some stage when we are thermodynamically at equilibrium. So that's very important to get this into the game. So you want to develop systems which spontaneously will organize, but in a controlled way. You want to control what's going on. Let me show you just examples of that by design. First of all, a biological example. When a virus builds up from its proteins and its genome, it happens in a self-organization way. This, self, this very simple one, the first one, which was quite well understood, which is here tobacco mosaic virus, comes from 2,130 protein subunits, bricks, and the genome, they get together spontaneously. In other words, it builds up just because they are together. Now you look, oh, that is magic. It's not magic at all. We can understand in detail everything that happens here. It's organic chemistry, it's structural chemistry, it's physical chemistry, it's these processes. That means that the surface of the virus is a complicated piece. 
it's a rather big protein. But the surface has all the points exactly located so that when they interact, they get together and then generate this piece of cake, which then comes together and forms a disk and lock washer and then the helical uh, virus uh, code. This is nothing magic. It looks like magic, but it is not. It is understood by the chemical principles we have nowadays. Now, let me just give you examples of uh, a few things which can be done, but I selected only one case because it's a, a rather simple one to illustrate. Let's take molecules which uh, can bind metal ions. And this can give this thing, which is sort of a complicated name, metallo, metallo supramolecular architectures. That means architectures which result from the binding together of pieces, molecules, through metal ion coordination. So the bricks are the ligands, the organic molecules, the connections, cementing units are the metal ions, and one can say that the, the information is in the ligand molecules. The reading of that is through the way in which the metal ions interact. They read this information, put the things together by their coordination geometry, and it also has interesting properties in terms of nano size nanotechnology. I can back to that very quickly in a moment. So, spontaneous generation, but controlled. And in doing that, things like that have been done, for instance. I don't go into details how it works, but you can make artificial double helices and triple helices. That's, in fact, the way we ended. We started developing self-organization processes in supramolecular chemistry. That's, of course, DNA, much, much bigger molecule. But this double helix and this triple helix, they are two entities which are totally synthetic and which can be obtained on the basis of how bit lines interact with molecular coordination sites. That's another one, just to show you a little cylinder, which looks quite nice and also illustrates how this thing works. You make this molecule, a long one, linear, you make those ones, flat ones, they have at these positions the way to interact with bit lines. You have to choose the right bit line, you just mix them in a solvent and you get it. You don't do anything else. You just design it right, and then it goes there. And this is a case where you have three linears, four planers, 12 cations, 12, 19 components get together in one step. And just, I wouldn't say one step, because they do lots of things in solution. They search each other. But the end of it is one entity. And this has been developing by many groups now in a very, very powerful way. For instance, we have some others here that's a grid-like. These are some nice flowers. I show them because with the, with the computers you can make them colored. Of course, they don't have these colors, but they look nicer. And uh, this now, this type of architectures have been generated. And there are many groups, and especially in Japan, they have done fantastic work in now this designing bricks, which when put together with the right metal ions will automatically generate a very complex molecule, a very complex supramolecular structure. Now, this is also of interest in the future, I'm quite convinced, for nanoscience and nanotechnology. Why? Because nowadays, our extremely powerful devices we have are made by fabrication. You make them. But can, could one not, in the future, just make the right components and let them assemble themselves? So the idea would be, in the future, to go from fabrication, the fact that you have to make it, to self-fabrication, which of course is the ultimate fabrication. And I can convince you that this is possible in a very simple way. The most powerful computer we have right now is what? The, our, the one we have between our two ears. That's still the most powerful. It's self-organized. You don't make it. It makes itself. Now, of course, I don't by say, say that it's a simple thing. It's an extremely complex thing. But self-organization can indeed in the future contribute to developing methodologies to do spontaneously, but in a controlled way, generate complex entities able to handle information. Now, up to now, I was discussing self-organization by design. I wanted, I said, you try to figure out how to build it. You build it and you let it go. And if you understand the things, you will get the output which results 
from the design, from the information you have put in the system, the way you have programmed it. But then another step, the next step in towards complex matter, what could it be? The next step would be to do it by selection. In other words, to let the system not only build itself up, but select from a complex diversity of entities the ones it needs to build itself up. And this is now the work we are mostly, wo uh, the work we are mostly doing. That's our main interest. So I would like to spend a little time on that. Because if that is possible, then what is the chemistry coming out of it? The chemistry is that it's a chemistry which will be, have to be dynamic in the constitution of the object. In other words, the chemical object will have to be able to separate into pieces, reassemble, reseparate, reassemble. If it can do that, it can also change when the conditions in the environment change, which means you can have adaptive chemistry. That is what we are now mostly interested in, trying to develop a chemistry where the objects you look at are able to adapt to changes, to respond to solicitations. So, this looked like something out of the blue. But you know, this often happens when you when do research. You suddenly realize there was something lying there which you took for granted. And you, you said, okay, that's normal. But you didn't think about exploiting it. And supramolecular chemistry is by definition a chemistry of weak bonds. Therefore, of objects which can fall apart. And if they can fall apart, they may reassemble, but maybe differently. So, this is a dynamic, non-covalent chemistry. A chemistry where the pieces are linked in a non-covalent way, but they can dissociate, reassociate, dissociate, reassociate. That is one thing. Then comes something else. We have been trained as chemists to make molecules which are stable. In other words, if you make a molecule which tries to decompose, you put it in the fridge. So to prevent it from doing that, you want it to keep stability. But then you can ask exactly how you turn your, that often happens also. You have to turn your brain 180 degrees. Say, what about making molecules which can decompose, which you want to decompose? That could be maybe interesting. At the beginning, people think, that is stupid. What a stupid idea to make molecules which fall apart. But maybe they have something which others don't have. How can you do that? You can do that by introducing into molecules bonds which can break and form, break and form, break and form reversibly. So this would then be, if you can achieve it, a dynamic covalent chemistry. Huh? But a covalent bond is the one which breaks. And we like to call that, it's a bit of a complicated name, but you have supramolecular on one way where dissociation is Intrinsic built in, you have molecular dynamics where you have to introduce intermolecular reversible bondings, and this I like to call a dynamic constitutional chemistry. That means on the constitutional level, the system is dynamic. It's the constitution of your chemical object which can change, fall apart. And of course, that makes possible adaptation. So, what is this sort of chemistry? What can it be good for? First of all, you generate what has now the, nine, the nice name of libraries. In the older times, you said, that's a terrible soup. You cannot do anything with it, and you put it in the sink. But nowadays, we have the machinery, the spectroscopic properties to analyze what is present. So now, this diversity is a big gain. You generate dynamic diversity. And also, because of that, you can now do selection through recognition because molecules can recognize each other. This also means that you can combine two very powerful entities. First of all, recombining all the time your molecular entities, combinatorics. And on the other hand, using the information present in recognition to drive the system. In other words, it's an interesting feature where the recombination of objects generates a high diversity combinations, very rich combinations. But you drive the system by the way things recognize each other. And let me illustrate that. It can be interesting for the search for biologically active substances, for dynamic nanostructures, and also dynamic materials. So let's first illustrate in just one slide what it has to do with this lock and key business. When you make the, the correct key for the lock, that's fine. Well, the correct key for the lock. But it's maybe take a long time. 
Or you can make many keys, like combinatorial chemistry does it, try them all. But that's not much fun because you count on the fact that you have, you are lucky that one of the keys will fit. So why not combine the two? Combine the power of combinatorics with the power of recognition informatics. So you don't make a key, you make just here many components, just fragments of keys. And these fragments of different shapes, colors, structures have a functional group which can make them reversibly bind together. So you generate out of these entities at the beginning all the possible combinations. They don't even need to be there. They have just to be accessible. You have, you can calculate how many by combinatorial mathematics. You can co calculate how many interconverting species are generated from these pieces. But then what do you do? Very simple. A basic law of thermodynamics is the principle of Le Chatelier, the law of mass action. You just act the receptor and it will select the best key, the one which thermodynamically binds the best. So the system does the driving. When the key, when the, the, the lock comes in, it picks up the best key and amplifies it. And then you can find the lead. It is not necessarily the best binder, but it is a good lead on the way to a very good binder. And that has been applied to drug discovery. We have done a number of cases of enzyme inhibitors, of also substrates or, syn or synthetic receptors, and so on. I haven't time to get into it, but it has to apply to carbonic anhydrase, to acetylcholinesterase, to the binding of sugars to concannabinoid, lectins, and things of that kind. Now, what about materials? Materials also offer a way to illustrate things well. What about materials? If then materials are uh, dynamic, they can have properties which static materials will not have. Maybe self-healing, maybe responsive, adaptive. That could be quite interesting. So, if we apply that to a specific field of materials, polymers, it would mean, what about making polymers which are dynamic? which can fall apart and reconstitute themselves. We call those dynamers, dynamic polymers. And they can be either covalent, where the bonding, the binding between the monomers, this is one monomer, that's the other one, this, and this end group is complementary to this one in terms of functionality, so they can bind together and generate here a dynamic chain, which can break apart and reform. It can also be supramolecular when the connections here are not reversible covalent bonds, but are non-covalent interaction, interactions between recognition groups, okay? So, then we can hopefully develop a supramolecular polymer chemistry. Now, I give you a sample now with formulas, but forget about the formulas, I want to point out something. So, can we do this, can we make such supramolecular polymers and develop a supramolecular polymer chemistry? The main chain of your polymer then is link, results from the linkage of monomers through these non-covalent bondings. And we made one monomer which has head groups which are complementary into another one. This is a donor of hydrogen bond except a donor. The complement is this one with acceptor donor acceptor. I just go quickly through that. I want just to come to the end of, the, of this slide. Then you can make a chain by attaching together through three hydrogen bonds this chain and make a long chain of supramolecular nature. Now here again, you will find in your career sometimes that people say, okay, so what? We are not interested. It took a hard time to convince polymer chemists that supermolecular polymers have some interest. But now, in all uh, meetings, big meetings on polymer chemistry, there's a section of supermolecular polymers. Let me show you why they can be really important. I have two cases which I want to illustrate. Let me also note, I usually don't like to go back to dates, but the first paper which introduced this field was in 1990. So, why do I show that? You will see in a moment. This is just to, to show you that indeed these objects where the components are solids and the resulting is a liquid crystal which is fibrous, which has fibers like shown here. Don't want to get too much into detail. What about this? So, 
1990, we had written, we had published the first paper on supermolecular polymers. In October 2013, I got a message from a small startup company saying, we have used supermolecular polymers to make biomaterials, biocompatible. So, okay, nice, what did you do? What they did is the following. They, the surgical treatment of children who have cardiovascular diseases, cardio, cardiovascular malformations, requires the introduction of some entity, some stuff, some, uh, it can be an, an, a piece of an animal, uh, um, a, a, of, a, of a tissue from an animal, or it can be an artificial polymer. They use supermolecular polymers for that, and not only did they make it, but it was introduced into children. And here's the first case. Dominica was implanted by Professor Leo Bocheria, whom I didn't know at that time, now I know him, and he looks really like that, like a strong surgeon, you know, strong person, huh? went to surgery, he looked like a strong person. He's a very nice person also. And this is three months after implantation here, and she's fine. Now it's more than, it's more than two years, and they're fine, and now ten, more than 10, because this light has been made up at some stage. Now many children are running around with some supermolecular polymer on their heart, which of course is fantastic in terms of satisfaction that has been useful also what you have been doing. But it also shows that, you know, we, were, we could never have thought of the fact that someday there would be children running around with a piece of supermolecular polymer in their heart. How can you just know that? So that also means let's do basic science. Somebody will find something useful with it. Without it, you will not find anything because there's no basic science. So this is supposed to be a breakthrough in surgical practice. Another one is self-healing polymers. This is a film, which you can see here, which is being cut in two pieces. You superimpose the two ends here, and you press just with your finger a little, and you can stretch, it sticks. And when you measure the mechanical properties, you lose only 10% after the cleavage. Now, this was also perhaps because uh, one can maybe still improve it, or we didn't press long enough, or things like that. But obviously, it's a self-healing film. What about now, this was supramolecular polymers. What about covalent polymers? If you use, pardon, if you use as binding units between a very well-known chemical group, which is reversible, the condensation of a carbonyl with an amine, which reversibly gives an imine, this one then can be used perhaps for making interesting polymers. Indeed, Mitsui Chemicals here in Japan, they were collaborating with us, and they usually were sending people to my group to develop the basic science, and then taking it to Chiba and to try to see what they can do with it. And uh, they made this 100, 200 kilos, I've, I've never seen so much of our stuff made. They developed it themselves as specific polymer, uh, the same principle. Uh, so this film is a film which can be, which is, has this, an interesting property. It is formed of biodegradable units, but when the biodegradable units are alone, that means when they have a long, long thing, the little beasts which have to eat it up for biodegradation can't do it very quickly. So you put imine bonds between, so that the first step in the environment is cleavage by water, humidity, and then you can begin to eat up the, uh, the, the remainder. And you can even regulate very well the degradation rate it can be stable for one week, one month, three months, and so on. So this, we like to call that green plastic. Nowadays, if something is green, everybody is happy. That is for me just a gimmick, you know. Green, so oh, what, 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 what the hell, green. Okay, so what about using other properties? So let's suppose we make films out of dynamic polymers and we superimpose these films. If the components are A, B, A, B, A, B, for one film, let's see, for instance, dialdehyde, diamine, dialdehyde, diamine. Another one, A prime, B prime, A prime, B prime, A prime, B prime. Now you put them on top of each other. What can happen? At the interface, you can hopefully generate two new combinations. Maybe A will bind with B prime and A prime with B. 
And in that case, if this connection is dynamic, then you will get A linked to B prime and A prime linked to B. The two new combinations which are possible at the interface. Okay, let's suppose it's an imine bridge, which is what we have been using. And let me show you now, first of all, a question. Uh, that's the best illustration I show you, an illustration using optical features. What do we do here? You take a film AB and a film A prime B prime and superimpose. At the place where they are superimposed, two new combinations can happen, as I just said. They can be, if one of them is colored, you will see it. Or if it has fluorescence, you will see it. Okay? So again, in collaboration with two collaborators from Mitsui Chemicals. They made this nice cat here. You have a cat. The head is AB. Moustache, eyes, inside of ears is A prime, B prime. Superimpose, you heat, color, fluorescence. Where is it superimposed? Of course, the other one is also somewhat fluorescent a little bit, but the real fluorescent comes in where it is superimposed. So that shows that at the interface, indeed, this recombination has happened, and you might even think of writing with a laser at the interface, or if you make a stack of them, you can write in three dimensions, in principle. Nobody has done it yet, but the principle is there. It can be done in principle. One other case of this covalent polymers, where one has I have a few minutes left, not many, but a few. Uh, that's another film which is now based on a diels alder reaction for the chemists in the room. You cut the film in two, you press with your fingers, and you can stretch, and it sticks. So there's either on the supramolecular level or on the molecular level the possibility to make films which can or objects which can repair themselves. Now, what about adaptation? I have no time to get much into that. This is the main work we are now doing, but I want just to give you a flavor of, of it. What would it be? It would be rearranging the components of your adaptive, your uh, dynamic object, either by expelling some components, introducing new ones, rearranging them, and so on, in response to different types of things, physical effects like light, or electric field, or heat, or chemical effectors like uh, metal ions, cations, protons, whatever. So this also then can be put into a network. I would just like to give you a flavor of what that network means. Just so you, we have done quite a lot of work on that, but just to get an into what it may mean. This is of course then an adaptive chemical system. So what are these networks? And let me just illustrate that in the following way. There's a set of entities which can reversibly combine. <coughs> now, this is of course a network, but let's, to simplify, just take four to make it simpler. If you have AA prime, which can react with BB prime to form A, 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 B, A, B prime, A prime, B, and A prime, B prime. These are four constituents. You can put that at the corners of a square. A, B, A, B prime, A prime, B prime, A prime, B. And as in th this interesting thing about these networks, they have relationships which are either agonistic on the diagonals, these constituents do not share a component. So if one increases, the other one must increase, must. Because if A, B increases, it picks that A, it picks that B, and it liberates A prime, B prime, which form A prime, B prime. On the other hand, on the edges, you have antagonistic relationships. If AB increases, it will, of course, make AB prime decrease because it picks up A, and the same for A prime B. In other words, this is just to illustrate that in networks of interconverting systems, touching one point in the network changes the rest of the network. Again, I cannot get into details, but it also means one thing, that you have information now not in a molecule, but in a distribution. In other words, suppose you drop into the medium something which will amplify AB. The fact that it rearranges will tell you in the distribution which results that you have 
done a given operation on AB. Now, this is a bit something I cannot really get into it right now, but I wanted just to sort of make you feel that networks are adaptive systems where because of the dynamics of the recombination can then lead to this possibility. So, chemistry starts with molecular. Without molecules, we are finished. We can't do much. Supramolecular, then it becomes organized, dynamic, adaptive, and that's a way towards complex matter. But before finishing, I would like to have some more general conclusions. If uh, I can still have a few minutes, please. So, chemistry. For me, the essence of chemistry is to create new objects, which did not exist. Of course, it's very important to also know the chemistry which already exists, but you have the possibility to make things which did not yet exist. So the book of chemistry, you have to write it, not just to read it. Of course, we have to read it. In plant science, I was working in triterpenes in my PhD. You have to analyze what is in the plant, very exciting substances, lots of drugs and all that. But you have to write it also. You have to write what is not yet written. Or you have to compose, and not only to play. So chemistry has a lot of creative power. That's why, again, I like to use Monsieur Rodin here, who out of a stone expresses a sculpture which is not in the stone. The artist expresses, makes the sculpture. The stone is dead, doesn't do it. But the artist, he or she does it. So chemistry is also the art of matter, the way of having a creative approach to making new entities of material type. Now, this is not so recent. The very, very famous artist, scientist, engineer, Leonardo da Vinci, wrote a fantastic sentence already many, many years ago. Let's look at it. If you speak Italian, read the top. If not, the English on is below. What did he say? When nature finishes to produce its own species. We are part of that. Man begins using natural things. That's the periodic table of the elements, the bricks of matter, in harmony with his very nature. These are the laws of physics. To create an infinity of species. Very powerful. Huh? The possibility now that we know at least some of the pieces, how we can do, what new things we can do. So in the past, that's the way there was some information transfer, if you want. In the present, that's it. For those who know where this is, that's in Italy, Capella Sixtina. But now in the future, what can it be? Maybe this. I don't mean that we necessarily, but, well, well, but you know, as we're sitting in this room, I'm, I can guess that maybe some people, of course, you have glasses. That's already a transformation. Huh? These glasses are not natural. Huh? You use them to correct. Or you may have some titanium in your hip. You may have new teeth. You may have a new lenses. So we already transformed. So someday we'll transform even more. And this is what we can do in the future for us. Now, in a small country called Greece, many years ago, 2,500 years ago or so, there was this myth about the gods, the goddesses, and all that kind of things. And Prometheus, he stole, he stole the fire of knowledge from the gods and brought it to mankind. And see, he is running away, looking over his shoulder, because hey, if the guys are not running behind him and trying to catch him, but he didn't catch him, and he gave it to mankind. So, so what? We are stuck with it. In other words, we cannot give it back. <laughs> knowledge you cannot give back. The knowledge you have it. You cannot just erase it. You cannot say, I don't know. That also means that we have to go along the way from the quest for knowledge to the control of our destiny. Now we are in power, and more and more, to change what we are. How we will do it? That's another question. But a lot of biological discoveries and all that, which, in fact, when you say biological, 
the basic of it is molecules doing something together. And we have to live with it, and we have to learn how to handle it. But you cannot erase what you know. So I didn't speak about mathematics. Let me just two slides about mathematics. Very famous mathematician, David Hilbert. David Hilbert is buried in Göttingen. Here is tombstone. There's something written here. What is it? We müssen wissen. We must know. But that's not all. Below, we werden wissen. We will know. That's a very strong statement. And here, thanks to science, thanks to Prometheus, if you wish, we will know. And for you, please participate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jamarine, for very interesting and exciting talk. And uh, we have a, uh, OK, the person over there. So thank you very much, sir. So my name is Amr Mohammed from Egypt. My question is that, so you mentioned that non-covalent forces play an important role for, uh, I mean, between molecules to identify and recognize each other. Are there any other forces that you, you may, I mean, discover or anybody else discover that would may play the same role for that kind of introduction, uh, interaction, sorry? No, you know, uh, it's like chemical, in other words, a physicist would tell you the Schrodinger equation contains everything, if you could solve it, <laughs> but you cannot solve it. So I think the non-covalent interactions, it's just convenient. You divide them up into what is usually mostly electrostatics, or van der Waals forces, but uh, you, you can, yeah, you know, the forces have always been there. But it is true that with the evolution of the field, people have found that, for instance, uh, negatively recharged entity, an anion, can interact with a, with a neutral molecule, which people at the beginning were thinking that would be repelling. That's the anion pi type of interaction. So one, this process is always present, but the recognition of what they are, this comes along. And this is one case of uh, rather recent recognition of a force, which is important, is a recognition of an anion by a pi system. So may I have another question? Okay, yes. Okay. So uh, professor, so do you think that we may see in the market some peptides that replace enzymes and fit the work of enzymes? This is an old story, you know, artificial enzymes, uh, synthetic enzymes in the laboratory. Ron Breslow has worked on that. Many people, uh, enzymes have been evolved to do a perfect job, to do some very important job, and they do it well. They did not necessarily optimize it. In other words, again, when it was good enough, it was, they usually stopped evolving. And one of my friends who had unfortunate disease, Jeremy Knowles, he was working on one of those enzymes which uh, uh, has to do with a very quick reaction of the organism, the fight and flight. Uh, either you fight or you fly, you, you, you run away. And these enzymes have to be very quick. Or let's say, for instance, at the term nerve ending, acetylcholinesterase. You have to hydrolyze the acetylcholine into, into choline and acetyls. In, if not, you are, uh, you, you, you are, you are blocked. So uh, these enzymes, some are very fast, some are slower, but some things, for instance, are still for chemists, uh, sort of very difficult to understand. Let's take, sorry, I'm talking a bit for chemists now, take an amide bond, like in peptides, hydrolysis, peptidases, they hydrolyze it at room temperature, at normal pressure. We cannot do that yet. We have to heat, we have to put acid, we have to put base. So that's an interesting problem still. The enzyme is exactly designed to do that and understands the parameters, but to make it and to realize it in a, let's say, in a tube, in a, in a sample tube, that is uh, still something we cannot do. And so also something else, which is, of course, the most trivial. H2O giving H2 and O2. Everybody dreams of that, huh? for energy and all that. Photosynthesis does it very well. 
we are not able to do it in the same efficiency. We can do it. We have worked on it also 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But uh, photosynthesis still works much better. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we may accept one more question. Yeah, the person was there. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, you wrote a uh, curry arrow and going up to, and uh, at the end, yeah, the adoption. But the next, and uh, do we, uh, are there some biological things or creation at the end? Or uh, we, uh, where, are, where are we going? Where are we going? <laughs> if I knew, I'd go there. <laughs> but no, I think no, adaptation is the, OK, let me at least point at one step. Adaptation, as I've shown it, you change the conditions, the system changes itself and adapts to new conditions. But if you remove the conditions, it goes back to the origin. So the next step is evolution. That means you go one step, you freeze it, and you go another step, and another step, another step. So evolution is the next one. And, uh, okay, you know, this arrow was probably too much like this. It should be probably like that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, I regret to say that time has come to conclude this uh, session. And let's give a big up, hand of applause to <laughs> Professor Dan Thank you very much, Hato. Well, thank you very much, Professor Len and Dr. Ikeda. So let's show our appreciation with a lot of applause.